Critique is defined as critical evaluation, especially when discussing art and literature. Criticism is defined as basically the same thing, but with a slight adversarial angle. Film celebration is defined as sucking corporate dick. For those out of the loop, Chris Stuckman is one of YouTube's biggest and oldest film review channels. I used to watch him a lot years and years ago. He even started up something called Hilariosity, which was his attempt at giving movies like Jaws the Revenge and other legendary trash heaps the Dutch oven treatment. Then at some point he changed his perspective and started catering to even the worst films. Glaring issues went ignored in fear of hurting people's fee-fees, and the man who once stood boldly for us, the audiences, and held Hollywood accountable tried to make a movie. In the process, he learned the way to make a film is to slurp the toes of Hollywood like junior high school students did for a fundraiser. Chris basically turned into Winston at the end of 1984, and his most recent blunder was his refusal to criticize Madame Webb, and the reasons behind the choice landed him in hot water. And since I haven't done a video like this since I tackled Patrick Willem's astonishingly bad take on plot holes, let's jump back into the proverbial arena and see what Chris has to say. Probably not going to do a video for this one, based off of what I've heard, since I do try to keep it mostly about film celebration on this channel. Having seen the film, I'm going to tell you that this is not a movie review of Madam Web. I am not about bashing filmmakers, artists. Choosing not to review a movie you know is being eviscerated online is as much an endorsement of its quality as overtly saying it. I know how hard it is to make a movie. I do not know how hard it is to make a movie under the studio system. I was able to make an indie film without a giant corporation breathing down my neck, which is not the privilege that S.J. Clarkson had when she directed Madam Web under Sony, which I can only imagine was monumentally difficult. Producers cause a lot of issues, given their main concern is the budget. This doesn't mean producers are always the reason a film fails, though. In fact, Clarkson herself stated she had creative freedom to do what she wanted. This isn't an issue of studio interference, quite the contrary. I argue the only reason the studio should be at fault here is that they hired Clarkson in the first place. More on this later. This is not going to be a video about Madam Web and telling you whether or not you should see Madam Web. There are plenty of people on this platform as well as a website dedicated to aggregating reviews and giving it a number that's going to inform you of that and you can choose to listen to those voices if you want. The information is out there. You mean Rotten Tomatoes? The website proven multiple times to remove reviews at the paid request of studios to falsely improve the perceived quality of their projects? Why would I ever waste my time on such a shit site? This video is inspired by essentially every live action film that Sony has had some involvement in since Spider-Man 3 in the Spider-Man verse, that being Spider-Man 3, The Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2, Venom, Venom Let There Be Carnage, Morbius, and Madam Web. This is about how Sony treats their characters and their properties, and more importantly, how they treat their filmmakers, and what exactly is going on, because I have so many questions. When you look at the films I mentioned that Sony has made, there's, of course, division from people about whether or not all of them are bad or good, and some people like more than others. They suck. Most of the movies you listed suck. Spider-Man 3 is infamous for studio interference, sure, but Sony fully backed Amazing Spider-Man's 1 and 2. The rest are a hodgepodge of ideas that fell through until they were revived like Venom or were a train wreck like Morbius and Madam Web. To exclusively blame studios for the failings of a movie is the same astonishing ignorance as claiming only white people enslaved others. I haven't mentioned the animated Spider-Verse films, both of them being terrific. The way I view the two Spider-Verse movies is kind of the same way I view The Invisible Man and Split and Get Out and other films that Blumhouse has produced. Because Blumhouse has produced a lot of other movies as well. But those three really do seem like, damn, where'd those come from? <laughs> The Spider-Verse movies exemplify merit and confidence. The directors have all worked on Disney and DreamWorks films primarily in the art department, so they knew their tasks, with the exception of Peter Ramsey, who directed Monsters vs. Aliens and Rise of the Guardians. Combined with the writers behind the Lego movie and A Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 1 and 2, it makes sense Sony trusted them to make a financially successful film. Some studios have really good instincts and they can pick filmmakers and stories across the board that for the most part are gonna be at least decent. I look at a studio like A24. Pretty much most of their movies, if you see a trailer for an A24 film, 
you can probably bet that it's not going to be terrible that it's at least gonna be decent, and maybe even really good. Are you kidding? A24 has a scattershot of quality like any other studio. Sure, they put out The Lighthouse and The Vivitch, but they also made pretentious shit like X and Midsummer. Why do you flip-flop more than fast food burgers? And I don't feel that way with every single studio. It's like a flip of a coin. You could get one of their best efforts, or you could get another one. And I do think it comes down to the filmmaker they're working with and whether or not they back off. Anyone else catch that hard cut? I didn't edit anything out of context because, you know, context matters. Did you notice his face? Here, this is the face of a man who knows he's full of shit. Throughout this whole video, Chris alludes to the team behind a movie as the problem. He won't admit it because he's all about film celebration, which is a weird anagram for I have no balls, but nonetheless, he fondles this point. The core issue with Chris's argument here is he doesn't want to hurt the feelings of people he believes are working hard. Well, tough shit, dude. The people behind these movies ain't putting in their best effort. It is healthy to criticize and question when something wrong happens. If you don't, then no one can learn from their mistakes. If no one learns, the bar lowers, resulting in fewer barriers to entry and a flood of lower quality and a pattern of repetition, which is how we ended up where we are in the first place. Let me put it like this. If a mechanic fixed your brakes, then your tire comes off, causing you to crash, you don't blame the manufacturer of the vehicle, you blame the mechanic who missed lug nut day. And I do think it comes down to the filmmaker they're working with and whether or not they back off and give that filmmaker the freedom they need to tell a cohesive, coherent story. That doesn't mean that every writer is gonna be great. Two of the writers of Madam Web worked on another film in the Sony universe that has been heavily criticized called Morbius. But sometimes what I've learned and what I've experienced myself, not on my film, but on scripts that I've optioned to some studios and it went nowhere, is that when people have power over you as a creative, when they're paying your bills and they're paying you well, they can tell you to do anything and you have to do it, no matter what. No, no you don't. You always have a choice in the matter. The argument that studios are exclusively the reason for bad writing, directing, or anything else of that nature is insane. Writers always have a choice to make the best possible script they can. Directors can always cut and reshoot a scene to get a better angle or performance. Oh, but the deadline! The budget! Yeah, how about time management and planning, or are these new concepts to most people? Yes, they matter, but the individuals who work on the project are the ones making things in the first place. If their best effort isn't on display, then why exclusively blame the studio? Sometimes that's exactly what it feels like when you're a creative dealing with a larger entity that has control over your creation or at least your script or your story or your characters. When they can tell you what to do and you got to do it, it doesn't matter if you think it's insane, you have to find a way to make it work. Sometimes pressure needs to be applied, otherwise someone's ego can get out of hand. Suicide Squad, Terminator, Dark, <coughs> Fate, and to be fair, just about anything Christopher Nolan has made all suffer to some degree of ego, whether it be an entire project in the case of the former examples, or the standard I have to explain my massive brain exposition in Nolan's films. I saw Madam Web earlier today, there wasn't a single part of me that thought, wow, this is just a terrible filmmaker. I don't believe you. I could not help but see the myriad of evidence that has been laid at all of our feet that this is a studio that is simply retaining the rights to their characters that does not care about the quality of this experience they're giving us. There's been too many examples of movies that all feel kind of the same, like a mishmashed early 2000s superhero movie. They can't seem to get out of that. No matter how many times we've said to this studio, we would prefer it if you went a different way. Weird how the myriad problems you claim you've seen ignores the obvious problems such as ESG and DEI that were forced onto Hollywood as far back as 2010 and has resulted in numerous people who aren't worth the water they're made out of to fail upwards. The Witcher, Castlevania, Marvel, Star Wars, Jurassic World, Velma, and DC come immediately to mind. All of the examples I listed were middling or bad, got worse over time, and or spawned something even even worse as a result. George Carlin said it best, it's a big party and we ain't invited. Currently in the industry, it's the wild west when it comes to spec scripts especially. From what I understand, a lot of spec scripts are not even being read. 
very rarely in fact, unless you're a very specific kind of movie or a studio is looking for something so particular that you just so happen to be that perfect thing. From what I understand, lower budget horror is still being looked at, especially haunted house things or things that are very marketable. But in general, the industry has no idea what it's doing right now post strikes. They have no clue. Movies are selling for almost $20 million at festivals from first time filmmakers and other movies that seem like they should be selling really big because of the names that are attached aren't. I disagree. Hollywood is reacting to factors it didn't think would bite it in the ass. To my previous point of lowering the bar and ESG, many of the actors, directors, writers, everyone involved who believed themselves untouchable were on strike in fear of AI as well as other issues such as securing more money for themselves. And where does the money come from? Us. If we don't watch the crap Hollywood smears on the screen, they don't make money, which means the studios must do what they can to avoid shutting down. Studios will be forced to rely on AI and ever cheaper talent, as has already been common practice, for as long as possible until they pull their heads out of their asses. Nobody knows exactly what's happening right now because everyone is so beholden to this algorithm or whatever Netflix is telling them people want to see. This is creating an almost robotic-like dystopian conveyor belt of movies that we are essentially supposed to kneel at the very end of, open our mouth really wide and just consume, and then ask when do we get the next conveyor belt thing that you have generated for us from your algorithm robotic AI thing, whatever that is. Agreed. Many companies make this critical error, which applies to all businesses, which I believe is a general bit of advice. Quality trumps quantity. Releasing good products in a reasonable manner and time frame is the best route. If you cheapen the product to meet ever-growing demand, you'll wear yourself out, which will have long-lasting effects, just like we're experiencing now. Because when I watched Madam Web, there wasn't a single part of me that thought a writer sat down and came up with the idea of the final fight happening underneath a giant neon Pepsi Cola sign. I just don't think a writer sat in their apartment in LA and thought, that's a good idea. Of course someone did. Hollywood is one of the only places in America besides politics where you can fail upwards. There are too many examples spewed out on a near weekly basis that this point is just disingenuous. Not to mention all of the examples I've already given. So what are my solutions for this? It's the same solution I've said for a couple years now because I've started to make more discussion-based videos about the industry and how we can communicate with them and get better films and start to enjoy the theater going experience more and not just hope that a great film like Godzilla minus one comes out of Japan so that we can enjoy that here. And it's the same thing I've always said, they hear us through our wallets. If a movie comes out that is genuinely great and we happen to see it in a the theater, that's fantastic. But then buy it to own on digital or buy the Blu-ray of it. Let them know like this is more like it. Yes, this has been the advice to moviegoers for many years. Only support what is actually worth supporting. The majority of what we review is garbage, despite Chris's denial, so when something good is released, it stands out that much more. It is our job to discuss movies and tell you whether or not they should be supported. This is where the frustration with Chris's view has been so loud publicly, as most people understand what Hollywood cranks out isn't worth supporting. They hear that. They understand, all right, so IP-ish, but original. Got it. And that's okay. Like, there's so many openings for filmmakers to take very original ideas into things. In an ideal, perfect industry, the filmmaker-studio relationship would be more of an understanding, loving relationship. But the problem right now is that so many studio executives, people who are making the decisions, did not come from a place of creativity. They were potentially managers or agents or people outside of the creative space in Hollywood who worked their way into a place where they're now telling creatives what to do. That's not the case for all of them, but it is the case for many of them. Yes. And this is why producers are hired to work with directors, writers, etc. However, no one can be micromanaged at all times. Plenty of studios and subsequently producers have great working relationships with the creative team behind movies that still end up as trash. Look at Blumhouse's catalog. And they don't have ideas. They just have like inklings of what the market might want. What's selling big? What's not selling big? Well, we need to go towards this path because that movie sold really big.
people are looking for this. Hollywood has chased whatever is profitable for decades. This isn't new, hence why video game movies and shows are the next to be as they have been mass-produced. And maybe westerns, but we'll see about that. So people have been put in positions of power who want to be creative, but aren't creative. But they're put in a position where they now have to tell creatives what to do. And that's why you're seeing a lot of these things that you're seeing in film lately. And the hopes are that more filmmakers are able to break through with like an indie film. Look at Nolan. He was able to kind of prove himself. He took those steps. You know what I mean? Hiring green talent has been a common strategy for God knows how long as a preemptive cost-cutting measure. If an indie filmmaker like Josh Trank knocks it out of the park with something like Chronicle, then the risk to reward ratio is paid off in spades. Not all filmmakers are good enough to flip something like Chronicle around and often fail because they aren't good at their job. S.J. Clarkson was given a major opportunity with Madam Web just like Josh Trank was with Fantforstic and bumbled it just as spectacularly with far less studio interference. All in all, like so many others, I, I'm frustrated by this take on Hollywood because Chris is close to understanding the core problems, but gets in his own way because he doesn't want to admit that people he supports aren't good at what they do. As I've said before, it is good and healthy to point out flaws or issues because without honesty and observation, no one can grow. You can't solely blame the studio for the poor quality of a movie. That's like holding a car company accountable for a drunk driver. Are we to let Zack Snyder off the hook for Batman v Superman? Must we apologize to Ryan Johnson for our criticizing The Last Jedi? That's insane! Some people are not cut out for the things they want to do. It's all right to admit Madam Web sucks. It's okay to admit S.J. Clarkson isn't a good filmmaker. At least right now. She could blow us all away with a future project, sure, but Madam Web currently is a reflection of her skills which aren't good. Your brazen support of those who do a bad job is part of the reason we're all in this current predicament. Barring, of course, other criticisms such as those that have fundamentally and legislatively changed the entertainment landscape, of course. Until you and others who share your view realize and accept that, then it is you who will ensure that we all stay in this entertainment dark age. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.